we're living in a very difficult time for all people in the creative field because there is no time for reflection, mm. thinking, even doing some bad work. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. Today, we're talking to textile designer Madeline Weinrib. Madeline started out as a painter, but after some successes and frustrations, she found true exhilaration in translating her painterly ways into the language of textile design. Over 20 years ago, in 1997, she founded her namesake textile business and launched her first carpet collection, and quickly became sought after and noteworthy for her deft, bold deployment of pattern, scale, and color, and modernized interpretations of traditional aesthetics. Always favoring handmade techniques over automation, Madeline cultivated collaborative relationships with artisan communities around the world, seeking to improve their economic opportunities while also preserving their craft and heritage. After 20 years in the textile business, Madeline has recently decided to close up shop. We'll get the whole story from her, but we understand that a big part of the story is that the insidious and detrimental practice of knockoffs has made her business unsustainable. So let's talk to Madeline. My name is Madeline Weinreb. I have long considered New York City my headquarters, although now I would add Marrakesh to that. That's very new because I think I'm in transition. I have certainly been a textile designer for the last 20 years. Before that, I was a painter. And I think I'm going to be continuing doing some textiles, but I'm going to be doing other things as well. And I feel when I think about what am I really, I guess I'm an artist that uses different mediums as my way of expressing myself as an artist. Wonderful. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you about art. Okay. But first, I want to go back to the beginning. I want to get a sense of like, what was your childhood like? What was your hometown like your family? Tell us a little bit more about where everything started. Well, I have to say, I don't think my childhood was particularly special in terms of the arts and how I was raised. I was raised in Westchester County, which is a suburb of New York. So I would almost add a typically American childhood in that regard with no particular stress on the arts, other than the fact that I had trouble in school. I had trouble with learning. And I was amazed when my art teacher started talking to me about what a wonderful job I was doing. So I think that is something that became very important to me in my education. Having trouble with all my classes and my teachers telling me I needed tutors. And then all of a sudden I go to an art class and I'm getting an A and they're telling me what a wonderful job I'm doing. So that probably was very important to me. Yes, that encouragement at such a formative age it gave you something to take pride in and, and something to feel good about when you were struggling in the other areas. Absolutely. I remember getting awards. I think I was in fifth grade when I got an art award, and I didn't even know you could get such a thing. (laughs) So it was really thrilling. And my teachers treated me very well. And of course, this made me feel wonderful. And I think that made me like going to class a lot more. So I mean, there's a lot to learn about that. I've done some teaching. And I realized the aspect of nurturing your students is very, very important. Mm. Mm -hmm. Can, can, did that translate to your parents too? Did they, were they in? Let's talk about that a bit. Um, But my mother was a very creative woman. Mm -hmm. Um, She was also, I would say, very typical of her era, did not work, but she was very creative and she had a, a little room that was her art studio when we were children. I look at her paintings now and I realize, oh, you know, they weren't all serious, but I certainly was dazzled by what she was doing as a child. She also did the interiors of our home, which was very beautiful. I grew up in a beautiful house and an American version of an English tutor. And my father had ABC carpet, which at the time, uh, did you not know that? I did not know that. That's great to find out. (laughs) Yes, I guess that's part of my story that he owned ABC Carpet. 
And at that time, it was what I would consider part of the Mad Men era. Mm -hmm. And what his focus on at that time, which he was very successful in, was wall to wall. And that that was really the fashion. Um, It was new, the idea of wall to wall carpet as opposed to rugs that just take up an area in a room. And he was very involved with that and very popular for, for that kind of design. So even though I don't consider him a designer, he was a businessman, he definitely saw something new of its period and went for it. And he also brought property or started uh, even renting stores in areas that were very unpopular, which is now the Flat Iron District. And at that time, he could rent out big spaces for not a lot of money. So it was very experimental. Mm-hmm. And as you could see, he really became a pioneer in the neighborhood, along with other stores like Barnes & Noble, which was down the block. And I used to go and visit that store a lot. It was their first store, and Barney's was right there as well. So, And they all became really much larger than life businesses. Yeah, so it's interesting. It sounds like your mother was... Um creative and an aesthete in her own way. And even though you say there was no particular emphasis on the arts, your dad had this creative entrepreneurial spirit. And then there's this early impression that textiles must have had on you. So Absolutely. Thank, thank you for that background. It, it's fascinating. And it, and it helps us understand how the magic of Madeline came to be. <laughs> I'm wondering about your your adolescence, your your teenage years, I mean, those are typically like a struggle for a lot of people. Um, they're both finding their identity. They're figuring out who they're going to be in adulthood. And I'm wondering how your creativity was expressing itself and how you were expressing your identity. Was it uh, smooth sailing or were you scratching at all of the openings? Well, first of all, I don't think I've ever had a lot of smooth sailing. I'm okay. just not that kind of person. It's, um, I, I've had lots of rough water. But I would definitely say by the time I hit the ripe old the age of 13 or 14, I knew exactly that I was going to be, wanted to be an artist. And instead of doing what other children do at that age, which is go to camp, actually a little later, I would say more 15, I signed up for classes in the summer at a place called the Art Students League in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it's still there. It's on West 57th Street. And they were just classes that you can sign up for, for art. And a lot of it was live drawing. And I used to take the train in from Westchester and go to class every day over the summer. And that was a really exciting period for me. Being in a creative environment like that with so many other artists all sitting around making drawing, I wasn't all that great at it. I was very young, but it was very exciting. I remember one of my teachers was a, an artist by the name of Poussette Dart, who became later known as one of the, the secondary level of the neo, uh, the abstract expressionist uh, part of the New York school. He was a very accomplished artist. And I can't remember anything that he did for me in particular, but it was so exciting to be part of his classroom. And I knew that this was something that I wanted to do. Hmm. So what happened next? Did you end up studying? I mean, did you go to college for this and study art in school? I did. I studied art in school. And as you remember, I had said I struggled with school. So I was very intimidated Mm -hmm. about the idea of going into a big college. I knew I wanted to be in New York. And I went to a school called Marymount College. Mm -hmm. And I I studied art. But I think what was really important to me then also was being in New York during the 1980s. -hmm. Because I'm looking back at that period, and I think that the 1980s was an amazing time in the city for the arts. There was Keith Haring and his Mm -hmm. friends that were making street art, 
and I was taking the subways and I would see his drawings in the subways and on the street, which was very exciting because this was teaching you that art was everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, and then there was Soho, which was really booming. And I would say there was not a Saturday in my entire four years of college that I did not go and see every single exhibition happening in the city. So I think it was a really good choice for me to be in a school that was small, Mm -hmm. but that I could go out and see things happening. It was a really exciting time in the city. I, I miss it, actually. I miss that kind of excitement to go and see what's happening and that people were doing new and fresh things and really questioning and challenging what art was. Yes, because it was a time when artists could still find affordable space and and could Absolutely. <laughs> and that environment fosters community exploration, exhibition. I mean, it could really support the art scene because artists could find a way to make a living and still contribute to their craft and to the scene. And I, I no question. came to New York at the tail end of that. And I feel your nostalgia for that period because yeah, we're losing that in the States. We, our cities are so expensive. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I felt was really important to me is I also created a kind of a really wonderful relationship with some of my teachers who took me under their wing a little And because of that, I almost did like what I would call an apprenticeship with them. I don't think this would be allowed anymore because there would be legal issues. It might even be considered, you know, free working for somebody. But it Mm. wasn't like that for me. It was, I had opportunities. I had a wonderful teacher. Her name was Melissa Meyer. She's a wonderful painter. And she took me under her wing a lot, which meant when she had a dinner party in her loft, It meant I could cook her dinner party for her and I wouldn't be paid for this, but it gave me great experience. Mm. I was able to see how artists interacted with writers. I remember very early on on that Jerry Salt would be coming to a lot of these dinners. Mm -hmm. And Jerry has gone on to become a very well-known critic. He was not known at that time. He was very young. But he was very smart. And uh, the idea that I was had the opportunity to meet these people and talk to these people is, was quite an important part of my education. Yeah, I'll say, because what kind of access? That's amazing access. Yeah. Because I would love to be a fly on the wall and hear those conversations. I almost didn't even understand how important it was until I look back at it. Mm-hmm. And also dealing with a lot of my young employees throughout the years. Now, when I started my business, I found that it was wonderful to mentor young people coming into my work. It was really something I loved to do. I had interns. I didn't even pay them, but I taught them. Mm -hmm. And some of them didn't even like me because I was so mean. (laughs) But that was part of what I was doing to teach them. Mm-hmm. And I think they, they did understand that later because they would come back and see me and talk to me about what they learned. But I would be afraid in today's climate to take on that kind of role with young people coming into work for me. It has changed for better and for worse. Yes. I mean, mentorship was a big part of your formation in the college years and then in those apprenticeships. But what were the first few years of your professional life like? Because before you got into the textile business, you were a painter exhibiting in galleries. Can you tell us about that chapter of your life? Yes, I think this was an amazing part of my life and a very, very difficult part and very humbling. And I actually look back at that and think that People should all feel somewhat humbled in their careers and remember that and remember how difficult it is and what a struggle it is. I think some people are very, very lucky and they get scooped up rather early and just have a wonderful, easy path. I was not one of those people. I struggled and I feel that it was very important for me to realize that I was 
probably never going to have a big career, but this was so important to me that I was going to pursue it anyway. Mm. And I would say there wasn't a week that went by that I didn't send slides out to 20 different places that were having exhibitions. And included in my slides would be a return envelope with stamps. And I would say as a young artist, I probably spent most of my money on that stamp (laughs) going in and back with not getting any good results. Mm. Slide duplicates are expensive, too. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you are entering a world that very few people find rewarding in terms of that they just immediately have a lot of success. Most people have to struggle and fight for it. It's a very good way to learn about the world, and it's a very good way to question your own purposes. And Mm -hmm. why are you doing that? Because I don't think it is for everybody. I think it's really hard, and there's not a lot of reward for artists unless they become very well-known and make a great deal of money. Most of them struggle. Mm-hmm. struggle financially they struggle in a world that doesn't respect them if they're not yes. well known it, it's a difficult path unless it's something you believe in with all your heart and you have a calling for and i felt like i had that i just was determined it was what i was going to do it was my calling and even if i was going to struggle i learned to believe in what i was doing mm-hmm. and i believed i had a reason for this i think also One of the hardest things for me as an artist and where I was really frustrated was that everything I did felt derivative. And I think it's a problem of our contemporary life where we've had thousands of years of art history. Mm -hmm. When I went to school and I was taking, I was an art major and also I minored in art history, art history really opened up my life. Mm -hmm. I I really learned that I could understand the entire world. I could learn all of history just by looking at art. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. every period had its own way of doing things and showed their beliefs and their styles. And this was fascinating to me because it was my first time understanding the world. And I think in my own work, that sense of history felt very important to me and was a big part of my own personal frustration because I did not feel my painting was reflecting my time. And this was what I began to feel was so important about art to looking at art history, that I wanted to do something that reflected the period that I lived in so that if Martians came to a destroyed (laughs) planet 500 years from now, which maybe they will, and, we, um, and they found my textile, they could talk about when and where they came from. Hmm. That was very, very important to me. I really struggled with it as a painter because I did not feel I was able to do that. But I did bring that mission and that philosophy and that commitment to my textile work. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about how you made that transition from painting to getting into textiles and where that all started? Yes, I can. And it was a difficult time because I was picked up by a gallery. In fact, because I knew we had this um, discussion today, I, I Googled something from years ago. I was wondering, hmm, I wonder if I Google my old, my old reviews if they're going to show up from the, the 90s that I got. And Ken Johnson, who wrote for the New York Times, reviewed one of my art shows, which was a very big change in my life. That was, mm-hmm. And I couldn't believe I was able to find it this morning. <laughs> I was like, everything, everything. It's so easy to find information. Um, and I was picked up by a very nice gallery. Uh, Chelsea was just beginning at this time. Um, and galleries were leaving Soho. And I got picked up by somebody about a year or two in, I was discussing with ABC making carpets for them, and which I had never wanted to do. Mm. But it was becoming compelling to me. And I decided that I would just dabble and explore textile. I wasn't expecting 
to become obsessed with it. But it became at that time, which was about 1997, it was considered a conflict with my gallery. They felt that it would make my work feel very decorative. Yeah, back then, they didn't allow for any crossover. Yeah. There was, it was a very rigid system. And mm. this was a dilemma for me in many ways, because while I was a painter, I actually really loved the decorative arts, although you didn't talk about it much. And I also loved fashion. And at this time, artists didn't dress. They had their own code of dressing, it, but it didn't really take on what was happening in fashion or in the decorative arts. All of these things were considered separate. And I feel that artists, they really felt like elitists over the other ideas. I'm sure that you might remember artists feeling that kind of elitism. But I thought this could be a really fun thing to explore because there were so many artists and everybody was doing the same thing that if I dabbled a little in decorative arts, there wouldn't be that much competition with mm. artists. Mm-hmm. So it would give me a little breathing room to play in. So that was my first thought as, as to why I w- was a- interested in doing this. I wanted to find a place to explore my creative process that wasn't crowded, that everything that I did didn't feel like it was derivative. I I even looked at my review by Ken Johnson, and he wrote that it reminded him of Terry Winters, which, you know, know, that's not what someone wants to see when they're being reviewed. Comparisons are hard that way, yeah. Because you want your own voice. Well, that's the word. Thank you. What I wanted as an artist and what I took to my textile was that I wanted my own voice. That was my main mission for me as an artist and as a textile designer. If it was going to be like somebody else's, there just wasn't much point to it. Mm -hmm. So that was how I was approaching it. And... I have to say, it had not yet really taken off, but I was really enjoying it a lot. I began to travel to Nepal and other places, and this was really opening up another world to me. And my gallery was having a very hard time with it because they felt that it made my work seem too decorative. And they actually said to me, you're going to have to make a choice. Do you want to be an artist or do you want to make these textiles? Hmm. Wow. They forced that choice on you. Can I ask you a question? Were they purely worried about the impression that your work in textiles would have on the marketplace? Because it wasn't changing your painting. No, I think they saw it as, again, you know, it was kind of an elitism, I think, in the art world had that they thought it brought my work down to being more decorative and less intellectual. Oh. But it was it was guilt by association with decorative arts as opposed to the actual totally. paintings you were doing. Yeah. Yeah, they weren't you no know, what I was doing didn't matter. Even yeah. what the carpet looked like. Um I, the gallery was going more and more conceptual mm-hmm. and they saw me as going more and more decorative. And it was a very, very hard decision to make, but I decided to leave the gallery. And the minute I made that decision, and I could tell you it was hard to make that decision because that was what I wanted more than anything. Mm -hmm. But when faced with that decision, I was so excited about the textiles then and the possibilities that I decided to leave the gallery. (gasps) And that was a huge move on my part. And once I did that, I went full speed with full obsession into what I wanted to do as a person in the decorative arts. And all that frustrated creative energy was like the pullback on a slingshot, (laughs) it sounds like. (laughs) It was a very exciting, exciting time because I felt full of possibilities and full Uh. of ideas. And I felt awesome that because it wasn't so popular for artists that I would have a little quiet time to play around without anyone even looking at what I was doing. Yeah, without the scrutiny. Yes, scrutiny is a very hard thing to be creative under. Oh, that's so true. 
It's so true. Even if somebody's breathing down your neck with a deadline, they're expecting you to be creative on demand. It's almost like you're crowding my brain space, dude. I'm not going to come up with anything, you know, inspired. Yeah, I mean, and this is, I think, a dilemma for all creative people now who are expected to perform constantly. This is not just people who do what I do. I, I very often talk to fashion designers who are at their wits end by expected to come out with seven to 12 collections a year. Uh, um, we're living in a very difficult time for all people in the creative field because there is no time for reflection, mm. thinking, even doing some bad work, which is essential you I think, need, for yeah. every artist. <laughs> Totally. Sometimes you have to clean the pipes, like you have to drain the system. Yeah. Totally. Totally. All of this is getting lost. Mm -hmm. And it's very sad. And I'm very anxious about it. And I think a lot of people are. It sounds like you are, too. Oh, yeah. I feel everything that you're saying. And I've also been in positions where I was expected to produce too much on a schedule without enough support. And it absolutely depleted me in a way that I'm not sure I've ever recovered from. I don't know how to recover from it. Yeah. And I see the problem all over the industry, including magazines, writers, journalists. Mm -hmm. They all have to perform constantly between magazines, blogs, the Internet. There is no room for fact checking. And everyone's exhausted. Yeah. And nobody necessarily is only writing about the things they really want to write about. They just need to constantly feed a machine. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. not nurturing it. They're not being critical. You really can't be critical anymore. There's not a lot of dialogue. For instance, when I first started making carpets, if a journalist wrote something about my rugs and it wasn't true, I would write in to the magazine and said this fact was not true, the magazine would then write a statement apologizing for it and correct it. This is part of the, of the way things have been done for forever. It's an interesting part because it's a constant creative dialogue where you're constantly uh, looking at work and fixing it, making it better. And that's even between a journalist and um, an artist. It's a constant process where... We strive for excellence on all levels. So, yeah. Of course, in a period where you just have to feed it, feed it, feed it, there really is no room for that kind of critical thinking and dialogue. Absolutely. Totally. <laughs> it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And that's why I'm really glad to be able to discuss this today. Um, I wish so much there was more discussion about it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people are afraid to talk about it because it could affect their ability to make a living. And everyone's worried about money. And Mm -hmm. that's really the source of all of this. Everyone needs to feed their their big money making. There needs to make a great deal of money to keep their machines going. Yeah, and it's becoming more expensive Yeah, it's more expensive to keep things running. And also, it feels like there's more people and more businesses every day coming up, and that becomes your competition. So you have to keep feeding or someone else will feed it and replace you, right? Very quickly. Very quickly. There's no respect for your own a body of work that's yours. So I have a body of work, which I think was my own language. I think it's recognized my body of work. But anyone who feels like it now could just take it Mm -hmm. and claim it as theirs and run with it. And if they have more money, more influence or whatever, it becomes theirs. Right. So I feel like we've entered into a dark period. I mean, there was a dark age in history that went for several hundred years. And I don't want to sound like doom and gloom, (laughs) but I think we're at the very beginning of a very dark period. I do think it's important that we're having this conversation. I I think it's really vital that, I mean, Jamie and I wanted to create this podcast as a way of like reinforcing the connective tissue between all creatives and also reinforcing the connective tissue between the general public and understanding the built world and all of the energy and critical thought and 
passion that goes into everything that shapes the built world. Mm -hmm. And so we have we have to discuss about how these systems and cultural practices and, and, you know, this engine that's like whirring at such a fast speed is going to burn itself out. And we haven't brought up social media, but um, I have a lot of concerns on social media, even though I'm on it. But one of the things that I find so interesting as an artist or even as a textile designer. So let me go back to when I started making textiles, I started working with cotton carpets and I came up with these designs. They were not popular. It took, I, 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 this was the first time I ever did something for ABC. And I made the cotton rug and nobody bought them. So they were like six months in and one of the carpets was the zigzag. All of them are now carpets that are being produced all over, just the knockoffs all over. But those first six months, nobody bought them. I think they were seen as aggressive. Mm. Um, they, my father wanted to liquidate them. You know, he was a retailer and a merchant, and he's like, yeah. uh-huh, these rugs got to go. We got to just liquidate them in the warehouse. And I said to him, please don't, please don't. I know I could sell these rugs. I just have to show people how to use them. And what I said to him was, I didn't want to work for ABC because I knew he would just liquidate all my designs. <laughs> um, so I asked for that space in the very top in the back. It was actually warehouse space where I said, if I could show people how to use them, I think they will sell. And the reason that I'm talking about social media here is because this whole concept of people liking your photos or not liking your photos, I don't think is very good for creativity, for finding new things, for advancing design, because what's new is not always liked. It it takes time. Oh, this is so frustrating for me too. Like, so I do a couple of different types of paintings and the ones I'm most passionate about are the ones that... I don't get a lot of likes on when I put on social media. And then there's another thing that I do that people really love. And so as somebody who also runs a business, I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe I should do more of the stuff that people love. But I don't want to abandon the stuff that I love doing more and the, the things that push me beyond my creativity and, and that I, I love so much just because other people don't love them too. Yeah, it creates a culture, too, where people who are commissioning work don't value innovation or creative expression. They just need the likes. And the likes mean it has to be homogenous with what's already out there. It's not trailblazing or unique. Trailblazing takes time, even if you don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Even if you think like, oh, this is new. It just came out yesterday and everyone's crazy for it. It doesn't happen that way. It takes time for people. And that's why an artist or an innovator has to believe in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I actually did believe in what I was doing, but I am not a person who believes in everything that I do. I am a person riddled with doubt in many, many ways. But the one thing I knew is I knew my work was interesting. I knew these carpets, these cotton rugs were new and different and interesting, even though no one was buying them. And, I could even go further to say that a very well-known design editor came to see them way back when. And she said to me, oh, well, these are nice, but I don't think I'll write about them. I just remember so much this moment because I remember thinking, boy, you're really missing the boat here. Instead of thinking, oh, gee, that means my work is not very good. Yeah. So. That's the kind of belief you have to have Mm -hmm. in your work. You have to believe that even if your culture is saying, "Mm, it's not that good, it's not that interesting to me, you have to believe in it. It it needs that kind of push from you. And it's very unrewarding. So that's why I feel it takes a certain kind of quirky character, someone who has a calling to do this. Because there's very little reward other than the belief in your own stuff. Everyone thought when I took that space up at ABC that I was going to go out of business in about three months. So what actually happened? Why didn't you go out of business in three months? Well, 
people suddenly started responding mm-hmm. to it. But that was about a year later than they were made. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really exciting. It was a, a really, really exciting time to be um, seeing people respond. And I look back now and I know what I was doing. I did not know at the time. What happened was there was a rug manufacturer in India who was making plastic cotton dirty and they were not doing well. And someone who I worked with at the time asked me if I would go and visit him in India and see if we could do something together Mm -hmm. to help him sell some of these rugs because he's a very nice man, but he's not doing well. So I went to see him and I thought it was a very compelling product. I love the flat surface of the cotton rug. I felt that it reminded me of drawing. And I began to think, well, these could be, I was making Tibetan carpets already. But I remember thinking that the cotton rugs were much cheaper than the wool and the silk, much, much cheaper. And I thought this was a very unpopular idea at the time, that it would be interesting as an artist and very challenging to make something that didn't cost so much money for people to buy it but to make it as beautiful as I could and uh, to take this material, which was not expensive, and show its beauty. So I think it was very unpopular at that time because the idea was really to sell your things for a great deal of money because that meant they were important and good. Mm -hmm. And again, I was taking um, an idea that was not necessarily popular and going there with the idea that I wouldn't have a lot of other people there competing with me. And there was no one else doing this. So it gave me a lot of room. And when I started doing this, I didn't really have a way to connect with the weavers other than to look at their work that they were doing. And I thought a nice way to collaborate would be just to use elements in their own work. I would point to things. So I remember doing the zigzag. It was just a a little part of the carpet. Mm -hmm. And I asked them if they could do the whole carpet, just like that one little part. Mm -hmm. And it created a dialogue. So I didn't really know what I was doing, but it created a dialogue between me and the weavers and a Mm. way for us to communicate with each other. I would say that they did not like at all what I was doing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) because you're asking them to change their methods, their formulas, right? And this is one way that we're very different than the East. In the East, everything was about, up until recently, it was really about tradition. There was a way they did it, and that was it. They didn't venture out. And what I was saying is, yeah, let's venture out of that. So um, it was not very popular. But when they started selling, it was very exciting for everyone, including the Weavers. Very exciting. Yeah, so it sounds like they needed a little bit of nudging to grow out of their traditional mindset. But then from what I've read and the research I've done about you, that that grew into like really mutually beneficial nurturing relationships between you and artisans in a bunch of different cultures. Absolutely, and, yeah. And bringing economic opportunity, helping to improve conditions, preserving heritage and craft. I mean, that must have felt to you so synergistic, like, okay, here's why I'm doing this. Is that what you were feeling? It was absolutely thrilling. It was absolutely thrilling. And I could not wait to really do more of it. It was so exciting. It was so exciting. When I would go to India then with this man who was who had his own dairy company, and it was not doing well. And suddenly there were weavers coming from all over to come and work for him and we would drive out to where they were working and living and they were were creating communities and there was fresh water there was medical care you know the thing about artisans around the world is that they're poor and they need support and help so when I was able to create work for them and we were able to bring in clean water, schools, all kinds of things. This was amazing. It it was so unexpected. I always thought I would do nothing but struggle. I never thought that 
something like this would happen and it would just take off and do so well. So that was a big eye opener and it was really wonderful. And it must have felt, you've mentioned choppy waters most of your life, but it must have finally felt like you got wind in your sails when you're able to be part of a scenario where everybody's benefiting off of this, where so much good is flowing through and it's all reciprocal and feeding each other and every, yeah, it must have felt really fertile and wonderful. Very. And I never thought it would end because I had a wealth of ideas. Hmm. I was very excited about it. I also became uh, very involved with a organization called Project Mala, which is in the rug weaving region of India, very close to, well, like two hours outside of Varanasi. That's it's a very poor region of India, and that's where they've been weaving rugs for centuries. And I went there with the very specific idea of looking for a charity to get behind and support. And I did find one that I really loved called Project Mala. And I still, to this day, am very involved with Project Mala. And they build schools in the rug weaving region. And because there are very few schools for these children, there are very few opportunities for people who live in these parts of the world. Um, You know, doors have really opened up now for them because there's internet. And if they can go to school and at least see that, their education is much larger than what we were talking about before, which is in a lot of these cultures, they're only taught their tradition. Mm -hmm. They, they 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 don't have books. So, you know, education is just so key to um, these impoverished areas. So when I saw Project Mala, I became involved very quickly. And every year I would go and visit. And every year I saw improvements. I, I was putting a lot of the money I was making back into Project Mala. And it was just really exciting for me to see how that money was being spent to build more schools, to build better schools, to have meals for the children who came to class. They would have breakfast and lunch. And these are students who probably wouldn't have breakfast or lunch if they were not there, that they had medical Mm. facilities. This was a wonderful, wonderful time to be part of something like that, that was doing so much for so many. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you for spending so much time and and money making those differences in, in that place. That's amazing. I do want to talk about the fact that after many successful years with textiles, you have recently decided to close the doors and move on. And I would love to hear about how you arrived at that decision. What made you decide to do that? And then we can get into what's next. I have to say that that was an agonizing decision. Mm. It was not an easy thing to do for many, many reasons. First of all, I, for one, was completely obsessed with my work. And I could not believe that I had grown something as large as it was. But I was having a very difficult time these past few years with what the knockoffs were doing to my business, the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. I had a showroom in New York and a showroom in San Francisco. Both my rents were going to be doubling soon. And... I didn't feel any longer that it was sustainable because you could buy my rugs practically anywhere, but not by me. I remember there was a rug store in New York. I don't need to say the name. And basically a high-end chain. And I was walking down the street and we looked in the window. I was with my friend, Rene Ricard, who who passed away about five years ago, but he was a very well-known art critic. In fact, he was the person in the 80s who first wrote about Keith Haring and Julian Schnabel, and he was a very important writer at the time. And we looked up and we saw all my rugs and fabrics in the window of a store. And this was not, it was a high-end store. And we looked at each other and said, it's all over. Mm. So um, it was very hard for me to compete with the knockoffs. It changed me in a way. I did not know how to deal with it. 
but it certainly did take away my unique feeling of my own voice. Right. Um, and it became very hard for me to sustain my business. Um, there was a lot of pressure and I developed e-commerce, which is a lot of work, not only a lot of work, but let me take that back. Very expensive. Um, Mm -hmm. The amount of people you have to hire to keep that going. It's a strain on a small company. It works if you're a big company and you're producing 10,000 pillows. If you're producing 10 pillows, it's really a strain financially. And the world becoming more and more like that was very stressful for me. And I began to feel I'm not an artist anymore. Now I'm just running a business. And that was something that I really, first of all, let me be clear on how hard it is to run a business and how much respect I have for people who do run good businesses. But I was finding it very difficult. And I had felt that I had lost my way. Mm. And, and I feel that with all the knockoffs out there, it lost its meaning for me. Mm-hmm. So how I was going to unravel that was rather difficult, but I managed to. And I don't really know how I managed it. It was so big. And several people have said to me, because I think it's very important that we state the obvious anyway and say that I am not alone in my feelings. As no. you all are, both are agreeing with, with me, yeah. there are many creative people now who yeah. are terribly stressed and upset and don't know really how to navigate this crazy world that doesn't have any rules. Or integrity. Mm -hmm. No integrity. None. 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 And it's 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 also filtering down to all levels. I mean, because we're not reinforcing the the integrity culturally or capitalistically, there are people who might see your work and like it on Instagram and then become copycats. It's a heartbreaking story because it's, an illustration of how this attitude that all creative work is now public domain is destroying the authentic voices. It's making it unsustainable for them to have any sort of standard of quality, to continue to create and innovate and and continue to have an authentic voice. And it's putting artists like you out of business, which makes me clearly agitated and, and, and heartbroken. And there's no stopping it. And the reason that I'm so happy we're discussing it is because I want to say more people need to talk about this. Nobody is because there's no money in talking about this. Right. And they might even lose their jobs if they talk about this. They can't, you know, so, but it is probably the most important issue for the arts and culture today. This is it. We are losing it. And we need to look at this and see, is this something we can prevent Or is this just coming into the 21st century and maybe there is no place for art anymore? No, I mean, I can't believe that. No place for art. That's a spirit killer, right? Society can't function Mm -hmm. like that. But but that's where I feel we're going. So we need to... We need to stop and look at it. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I think we're... We've got this momentum that's going in the direction that we've got to figure out how to slow it down and then turn it around. One of the things that I think would be so important is resources for people, creatives who are being knocked off. I know more people than I can count on my hands and and feet that have been knocked off and not had any resources Mm -mm. to do anything about it. We need pro bono legal advice. We also need a culture and a community of support We also need it to be clear that designers frequently who get in-house jobs at bigger companies get pressured to knock, like, find out what's cool on Instagram and knock it off. And and we need to empower them to stand up to their companies and say, that's unethical. That's not cool. And how about we just come up with our own ideas? But they'll lose their job if they say that. And we've got to 
we've got to band together and support each other in figuring this out. But I think pro bono legal advice is something we could all, Mm -hmm. all use. There's not a lot of that out there. Mm -mm. And I would like to add something because I have been knocked off by so many people. And some of them have been by these lower end brands. But some of it's also by high end brands. Some of it's by designers who become celebrities who Mm -hmm. were my clients and now decided I don't need to buy it from her. I can do it under my own name and make all the money, make all the money. So So it comes from everywhere. So what happens though is the stealing of the design is just the first step. Then when you try to approach them about it, you're really dealing with a lot of aggression. And it became a lot for me because some of these people were my friends. It became, I'm, I I just couldn't absorb the amount of defensiveness that I was feeling when dealing Mm -hmm. with people who were taking my work from me. So it's terrible. But there's something that I'm really, I think it's very, very important to address. And I'm going to take this opportunity to address it. It came up yesterday because now that I'm really working in Morocco and wanting to work with Moroccan artisans and their wonderful sense of design and artistry. I was working with the product and I actually had it on Instagram mixed in with some of my pillows. And yesterday, this was about a year ago, I saw one of the chain stores with the same products, but obviously they're mass produced and factory made with pillows that look just like mine. And I was sick from it because this is a product that I'm still working on with people in Morocco to where we're selling it in Morocco. And what I'd like to say is do not steal this. It's you're not stealing it from me. You're stealing this from communities of people who live in Morocco. It belongs to them. They do not have a way to protect themselves. And when you steal it, you steal the only way they can make a living. So it's it's not just designers. It filters down into these cultures. I thank you for saying that and for drawing a very specific line directly to whom it's hurting by stealing these designs. I think when you put a pretty picture on Instagram or in a glossy magazine, there is an assumption that there's some elite designer who's sitting on stacks of cash And you can just go ahead and take what's cool because it's part of the cultural zeitgeist. And now um, I can do what's cool, too, because I don't have my own voice. And there's no connection to how you're actually destroying economic opportunities for everybody along the whole chain. And there's direct repercussions. That's the real problem. And about six months ago, there was an article in a newspaper about how... Moroccan carpets are so diluted and they're everywhere. Um, They're made by everybody and they're just so over and tired. And I just felt like writing in and saying, well, now that everyone has stolen these designs from the mid Atlas mountains and the people who make them, now that you're declaring that they're tired and over, what do you think the people who live in these mountains, who live in Morocco, who have been, working on making these carpets for generations are supposed to do. They've already been robbed. So, um, but there is not a lot of awareness of this. And Mm. um, I think we need to bring it, make it an issue. And I don't know if I, I don't know how to do that. Well, talking about it is part of that, Mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we've inflamed the passions of some of our listeners and, this discussion will ripple out and, and people will start talking about it. I think education's part of it, too. I think a lot of people just don't know this is happening. And so it's helpful to just just talk about it and make it a topic of discussion that's not taboo because we need to know how it's impacting the health of our, our global creative society. Mm-hmm. Well, well, certainly if I look back to the 80s when New York was such an exciting place and it was so creative, there were lots of controversial dialogue going on. There was lots of it. And I I just think that now we've come to a place that people are afraid to do that. So that's why I'm I'm so excited about talking about it right now. I am hoping 
that it becomes more of a discussion. Well, we are too. And so thank you for sharing your very personal story with us. And I'm, um, I'm very interested in, in what your life is going to look like now because you've made the agonizing decision to close the doors on your textile design business. And I know you're a creative, it's your calling, so you will be endeavoring in many creative pursuits. But, uh, you know, on a very personal existential level, do you feel like the road is wide open for you? Do you feel like you're on a new path of discovery? Yes, but I don't know what it is yet. Of course, um, yeah, um, you're, you're in the midst of discovering it. <laughs> but but you know, it's funny. I did take. I I am. I I didn't rent a studio. I have bought a studio. You know, when I closed my business, I put everything on sale, and it did very well. And I decided I have to create something where I can be creative, but it's sustainable. I don't want a big business. I want to do something where I could go every day and not have a lot of people there where I have 35 people that are expecting a paycheck at the end of the week because that's so much pressure. Mm -hmm. It's between that and the rent. I mean, it was just, I had a stomach ache every morning. So, So I bought a studio in New York. It's not quite ready yet. I have made a decision because since I closed my business, I've received an email or a call almost every single day from somebody saying, I know you closed your business, but would you please make a rug just for me? Oh. And I wrote back and say, well, okay, you know, I will make one for you. So I think I will have a small part of my studio where I will still make rugs for people, but I don't know what else I'm going to do there. And I'm really excited about this I don't know phase. Yeah. Because it's open to exploration and discovery. And it's a period that I haven't I haven't had this feeling in so long. And yes, I'm f i am I think I have a lot of anxiety and a lot of self doubt. But at the same time, I still believe in myself. So it's a little back and forth, and I'm excited to see about what's going to happen. I think anxiety is part, and being unsure is really part of being creative in that process. I don't think it's all fun, and I'm definitely in that. There's been a lot of discussion about returning to painting, and I think I will do that. But when I discuss it, I'm asked questions like where I'm going to show them, where I'm going to sell them. Um, how much I'm going to sell them for. And these are things I just can't answer until I make my work. Yeah. I, I don't know how. Yeah, I don't feel, I feel like it might take me five years. I don't know. I, I want it to be real. I want it to be from the heart. I want it to be good work. I don't want it. I want to get off this this machine of just making things and just throwing it out there. I would like to wait until it's worthwhile. So I'm going to try that with my new studio space and see what happens. I'm also still making products in Morocco that I'm selling there. So um, um, hopefully I can do a lot of that from my studio as well. That sounds fantastic and exciting. It's very courageous that you bought yourself some breathing room again, that you took that step because you, you can't keep the machine running indefinitely like that. You you just can't. I really have made the decision that I will not do anything I don't believe in. And I will then see what opens up. I was just going to ask you about El Fen, because I know that that's something that you're involved in. And I would love to hear more about that. Have you seen it on my Instagram? Mm-hmm. I, I post pictures. It's absolutely beautiful. I've been going there since they first opened in about 2004. To orient our listeners, can you just give us the overview? It's a it's a hotel in Morocco, right? In Marrakesh? In Marrakesh. In Marrakesh. It's a hotel. It's a boutique hotel. It only has about 37 rooms now. Mm. It's in the Medina, which is the, um, the old part of the city. And it was first uh, created by my new partners, a woman named Vanessa Branson and Hal James. And... The word Elfen actually means fine art in Arabic, 
And Vanessa Branson is an art collector, and the hotel is filled with art, but primarily now Moroccan and African art. And it's a very beautiful place, very inspired, I think, by Morocco and its rich color palette, which is all over the hotel. And um, it's a place that um, everyone who's affiliated with it is very creative. My husband and I just became partners. Um, Also, the manager is a, a partner, Willem Smith. And all of us are contributing to the uh, creativity of the hotel. It's a beautiful place um, there. And I felt at home there when I first went in 2004, and I've been going ever since. And it actually came about organically, becoming partners, just from being there a lot and getting to know our partners now and getting to know each other slowly. I think we all function in the same way. There is no business plan attached to this hotel and our partnership. We are just um, exploring what we can do. My main part of the hotel um, is going to be working with the boutique and making products in Morocco and selling them in the boutique and working with a lot of women's cooperatives and working with lots of artisans and lots of young um, Moroccan brands. And the thing that excites me is that it's small enough for me to keep it sustainable. And that's why I was so upset though when I saw yesterday um, on my Instagram account, somebody knocking off these designs that we're doing in Morocco and mixing them with pillows that look just like mine because the last thing in the world I want to happen is for this to get wrecked. What I'm hoping to do, although I don't know if we're going to do this, but I'm hoping to keep it offline. And I'm hoping yeah. to create something that feels like an experience. I think the fun of traveling, a lot of people talk about how it used to be so much fun to go traveling and you could buy something in a country that you could only buy in that country mm-hmm. or maybe even in that store in that country. So it was a, it was a bit of an adventure and a story and a memory attached to the object. And of course, the internet shopping doesn't have any of that romance to um, see what's in the shop. You have to come to the shop. Yeah. You have to travel and have an experience. You can have your own magical experience of discovery. It sounds like you're you're helping to create that for for others. I love it. But I think I think as design people, you would love Elsa, and it's truly inspired. And it's a wonderful mix of what I like to do of different cultures. You could follow it on Instagram. It's called Elsa E L F E N N. It has a very popular Instagram account because it's so pretty and luscious and colorful. Oh, great. I'll definitely do that. Speaking of things you're involved in, is there anything you have coming up that you want our listeners to know about? I know you said you're kind of in the process of baking ideas and thinking about things, but besides Elfen, is there anything else we should keep tabs on? Well, primarily, I would say my new studio. Mm. You know, that's, that's really what's coming up. And I'm really excited about it. And I hope, um, you know, I'll have some kind of an announcement when, when it's open. And then, then we'll see. But I, I really think that is the thing uh, most for me is this new studio and to see what will come out of it. In the meantime, can you share social media handles, websites where our listeners can follow you, look at your work, look at what you're doing? But not steal it. <laughs> None of our listeners are allowed to steal any designs. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I'm, yes, please. But I, I actually, I don't know, I guess this is a terrible thing to say, but I'm, I'm less active on social media now than I usually am because mm. I think um, I needed to be a little bit more reclusive. It was mm-hmm. something that I noticed about when my business began to take off and I had employees and I had a lot of them. I was always used to um, a day of of being on my own in my studio. I liked solitude, and I think artists in general have a lot of solitude, and I kind of lost that as it grew more and more and more into a business. And so I feel like I've gone right back into a little bit more of a solitude mode. 
so I'm not as active on social media. I also have, um, while I enjoy social media, I have a lot of concerns about it. I think it does a lot of bad things. And um, I'm thinking to hopefully be more involved with dialogue about the problems of social media. I think a lot of women are having personal emotional struggles over it. The idea of, again, talking about likes and popularity, it's not a particularly positive one. And it's certainly um, not very helpful for a lot of women. And I, and I think that a lot of people are struggling with this. And I, I actually would love to be more involved with dialogue about social media and its effect on women and, and our culture. So no one has asked me yet. So maybe one of your listeners will invite me to be part of that discussion. <laughs> and I've also, I'm hoping in the future to talk more about relationships that women create with other women professionally, because I think that there's a lot of problems there as well that probably stem from women being so new in the, in the workforce. Lots of women are very supportive and it's wonderful, but a lot are not. And there's a lot of uh, rivalry and competition, which I think is very difficult. And I would love to have that more come out of the closet and be more of a discussion. I hear you. I would like that, too. I think it also it just helps to reestablish what the new code of ethics is for. Yeah. For camaraderie, for sisterhood, but also for the greater good for overall society. A rising tide raises all ships, right? Well, what you said is very important. And I meant to say it and I just didn't. But there is no law on social media. It's everyone can do whatever they want. There's no etiquette on social media. So it's as though we're, it's like a new baby that no one really knows how to work. Yeah. And we need to learn these things. I think we just need to have more discussion about it. And I want to give you a heartfelt thank you for, for sharing your story with us and for telling us and, and being so thoughtful with, with everything. Um, that you shared with us. It was, it was really meaningful. I really enjoyed this discussion. Yeah. Well, thank you. When you first approached me, I was like, oh yeah, this is an opportunity to really talk about what matters and what's important. I don't even know how to feel right now. I feel a mix of that sort of gooey, wonderful feeling that you feel when you have a really meaningful discussion mm -hmm. with somebody who's really thoughtful about everything that's transpired in their life. And then I have a lot of rage. <laughs> yeah, I, I also feel kind of sad. Um, yeah, I'm sad too. Like, I don't know. Creativity is being is being co-opted and culturally homogenized. Like, watered down and homogenized mm -hmm. and I don't have a solution. I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know either. Um, but I do have to, uh, I mean, I have to give her credit for making that really, really difficult decision. Um, oh, I have no yeah. idea what it's like to have been in that situation. I don't know what I would personally have come to, but um, I, I respect her decision to move on to something that she feels is more meaningful, more creative, and can offer more to the world, I guess, at this point, in, in after realizing that, you know, now that she's put this thing out there, and everybody's copying it, like, what is she really there to offer? And like, how can she even sustain it? So she's kind of decided, okay, let me do something completely different that offers more value. And I, I love that, but I, it must have been so difficult. So difficult because she also, in, in the creation of her original designs, she also created a channel of economic prosperity for so many artisan cultures around mm -hmm. the world that she worked with. And th those relationships must have felt like, like babies to her, like, like she was nurturing mm -hmm. them. And then she had to be the one. Yeah. I mean, they were being starved because it was unsustainable to maintain the business. But then to make the decision to actively shut down her business 
must have felt like she was abandoning them. And I know she wasn't, but it, it, I'm sure that tugged at her yeah. heart in a way that's like gets to your core, like the core of mm-hmm. your being. Yeah. Ugh. Hey, everyone. Jamie and I were really just getting started there, and we actually had a lot more to say on the subject. It's an important topic, so we decided to include the rest of our conversation in a bonus episode, which we'll put out next week. So stay tuned. To see images of Madeline's work, go to cleverpodcast.com, or you can click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're feeling generous, please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find us and helps us keep making this show. We also love to chat with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, aka 2VDE Media, with music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.